In 1928, a philanthropist confided his vision to a young Baptist minister that he envisioned the congregation that could be an interdenominational house of worship centered in justice. Soon the work began to found the church. Little did either of these early founders know that in the midst of construction, the stock market would crash and that the United States would enter one of the most painful economic depressions in its history. In 1930, deep still in the heart of the depression, the church was complete. Riverside Church in New York City opened its doors, served by that young minister, Harry Emerson Fosdick, in whom the philanthropist John D. Rockefeller had confided his vision. Today, Riverside continues its legacy of social justice. Some of us might rightfully feel that encountering the world today from wildfires in Portland to flooding in Texas as another hurricane batters at this moment our brothers and sisters, our siblings in spirit in Florida and moves up toward Georgia and Tennessee. Some of us might feel that it's hard to imagine in a literal storm, not to mention the political storm and the human rights storm that there will be a dawn from these dark brooding clouds. I was in DC again this week for health care and then rushed back mid same day actually, thankfully they have a high speed train, to attend a rally in support of DACA. Someone snapped a photo of me and Reverend Emily that made its way to social media. To say that I looked unhappy would be an understatement. <laughs> Someone posted a capture to the photo that I was everyone in our country right now just not having it. <laughs> Probably accurate. Has anyone here had a moment in the last few months of just not having it? Can I get and amen. Amen. <laughs> now here is why on that particular day I was just not having it. It's because I'm tired of playing defense. I am tired of playing defense. My good friend Reverend Charles Boyer recently reminded me that playing defense, you see, is only 50% of being faithful. He said this to a group of social justice leaders that we gathered from across the state of New Jersey just this past week, right here in this sanctuary, to kick off a New Jersey prophetic agenda that will speak prophecy. And so Reverend Boyer reminded us that 50% of doing justice work is playing defense. But he said, it is at our peril that we forget what the other 50% is about. And that is imagining and working toward the world we still believe to be possible. He said, don't get me wrong, you've got to play defense. You have to stop injustice, you have to save lives. But you also have to manage to keep your eyes fixed on the world that you are going to build. You have to have a plan to get down the field. That's about as far as my sports metaphors go. <laughs> now we are playing a whole lot of defense lately and when I played soccer in school, I was a midfielder and so I knew what it was to have to drop back to defense in a moment to protect the goal, but I also knew that you can't win a game just by keeping your opponent from scoring. You have to get the ball in the goal. 50% of prophecy is reaching toward the world that can be, especially 
when the world is at its worst. That is when vision becomes desperately important. There's a story that I believe is a, a myth story, a story designed to tell us a truth, not the literal story itself, but has a message in it. And it's about a man named Noah. Has anybody heard this story? <laughs> so his name could have been Noah. His name could have been Tuli Patel. What? His name could have been David Gordon. Noah was the kind of man that knew how to play defense, but also knew how to keep an eye fixed down the field. Now, when Noah realized there was going to be a great flood coming, he knew there were two things that needed to happen. One was there needed to be an ark built to get everyone in, to keep as many folks safe. But Noah also knew that at some point, they were going to have to get off the ark and build a new world. But they couldn't build the new world without the ark. Now, I imagine Noah was kind of an irritating dude. He pestered people when the day was beautiful and the skies were clear, and he kept saying, Folks, we've got to build the ark. Come together, we've got to build the ark. Keep your eyes fixed, we've got to build the ark. Folks, we're going to need the ark. And I can imagine people saying, Noah, shut up about the dang ark, okay? It's enough about the ark. I don't see why we need the ark. The sun is shining, it looks fine. We're comfortable where we are. Why do we need an ark? Stop it, David. I mean, Noah. I mean, Noah. <laughs> Noah. Sorry. <sighs> Tired, I guess. Mixing up names. But at some point, Noah kept persisting. And at some point, enough folks gathered with hammers and nails and started putting that ark together. And when the ark was built, then they started to really look for the people that were going to help seed the new world. And they gathered those people together, and they got them all on the ark, and all of the creatures, and the seeds for new life. And then the storm came. And as the waters raged, they didn't cower in the little corners of the ark saying, what are we going to do? They got to work planning what they would do the minute the storm stopped. And they sent out scouts, right, to look for dry land, for every single place where a new world could be seeded, where the waters had receded from, where it was safe, where there could be, one might say, sanctuary where a new world would be built. Now, I can't imagine in this place, I wasn't here then, but I can't imagine a lot of people told you that when you purchased the property next door during an interim time, that it was a good idea. Did anybody tell you it was a bad idea? Anyone? So maybe you couldn't do it? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But like Fosdick and Rockefeller, you pressed on. Now this year may not be the story that any of us wanted for our country. This might not be the world that any of us, no matter who we voted for, would really want right now. Like the mother reading Hansel and Gretel though, we can feel powerless watching the story unfold, screaming to the children, don't touch the gingerbread house. But Reverend Lynn Unger tells us that the story isn't sealed, that we can drop a stone, mark a trail out of the horror of the story. Lynn Unger tells us that we are the ones we've been waiting for to be the hero in the story. This is from Annie Dillard. She writes that there's no one but us. There never has been. 
And who are we, she says, to buy the communion wine, to walk around with God in a bottle on our backs? Frantic and fallible as we are, hurt and hungry and forever needing something we cannot name, we are yet drawn to a ministry by this very promise of intimacy. We shall be sent to bring the good news, scouts to find dry land, to minister to the people, to heal the broken world. Yet the first thing we learn, if we learn anything, is that God, the source of love, is not domesticated. The institutions we serve survive not because of our power, but because of a grace, and so do we. And we learn that you buy the communion wine because someone has to, and that there is no one else. And perhaps it is that, that very thing, the care that will do whatever mundane thing must be done for the sake of the people's gathering that begins the holy alchemy and makes the wine into communion. When serenity and single-heartedness and graceful wisdom come, it's not because we have earned them, not because we have been so good that it finally yields to us, Soon enough, we will find ourselves once again scattered, confused, making it up as we go along, but to stay with it, to buy the wine when there is no one else, not because we are particularly fit to do it or ready, but because there is no one else. Dillard speaks to those who realize that the miracle in community is not a distant savior who rushes in or a miraculous change of the water in the vessel. But that moment when you realize, you look up and you look around, look around, to find that you are in the story you once read about and that you are the ones you've been waiting for. This sanctuary is a beautiful sanctuary. And it seats 120 with somewhat diminished views. Our membership is 465 adults. Not to count children and youth. We would add several hundred then. We have over the decades climbed up to 500 and promptly gone down because we don't have enough room here. We are dimming the light of a beacon that needs to be brighter right now in this storm. It is 1929 all over again, and we are in the midst of a brewing, devastating storm. And if we do not build an ark, make no mistake that this is life or death. This isn't about the luxury of a larger space. This is about a sanctuary for all the people who need this place and who cannot come here because there isn't enough room. Sanctuary brings us together. Sanctuary is a spot of dry land in the storm. It's a place to learn how to build a new world. If we really want to offer sanctuary, sanctuary to undocumented folks who need shelter from the storm, if we really want to gather minds from across the state and across the country to envision a new world, they need a place to do that and a place where we can all gather in. We need to build a brighter beacon. I've thought a lot on that train back and forth to D.C., sometimes daydreaming, sometimes literally sleeping, but that if I could wave my magic wand and have anything done at all tomorrow, what would it be? I would build that building. I want to do something here that hasn't been done before. To cast out a light that a century from now, someone will nod as they hear the story and say, of course they built Riverside Church in the Depression. Of course they built Beacon in the midst of the great horror. And it is here today and we are here because of it. 
Progressives are so often approximate people. Even the word progressive sounds somewhat cautionary. We're not going to make extreme sweeping changes, we're going to make progressive <laughs> changes. We're going to plod carefully and not get too excited. But we cannot be plodding right now. Praise song, says Elizabeth Alexander. Praise song for the struggle, for the courage to walk into the widening pool of light. We need testimony to what can be done as surely as we need to testify to what must stop. We need to shine our light, not hide away, not in progressive steps, but in a movement that could leap us across the chasm. We keep going up. We keep approaching it. Now is the time to leap, to build. We need, beloved, to be companions of courage who dare bring the bottle of wine and into the common vessel, pour it forth with abundance and faith so that someday there can be a toast to a world that we do not know today, but we know can be. We need harbingers of joy who will grab a hammer and a nail and build the ark when no one understands why in God's name we are doing that. We need Noahs to urge us onward and to be pains in the butts. We need sparks of creation to engender a new world, and we're going to need scouts to get ready to go out and search for every spot of dry land there is now, for every place of fertile ground where the seeds can be dropped for a new world. We can seed, beloved, community. We need a brighter beacon, though, to do it. We need to magnify our light, and we cannot hide it under a bushel. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to shine my light. I'm going to let it shine no matter what it takes. I'm going to shine my light. I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Amen.